This is a presentation on the life and legacy of Thomas Paine, the 18th century's most remarkable champion of liberty. He was born Thomas Paine, P-A-I-N, in Thetford, England in 1737. His father was a member of the Society of Friends and a staymaker by profession. His mother was a member of the Church of England, which caused his father to be expelled from the Quakers because of his marriage outside his religious sect. Thomas was removed from school at age 12 to apprentice with his father as a staymaker. Payne later wrote of his earlier education, my father being of the Quaker profession, it was my good fortune to have an exceeding good moral education and a tolerable stock of useful learning. I did not learn Latin, not only because I had no inclination to learn languages, but because of the objection the Quakers have against the books in which the language is taught. But this did not prevent me from being acquainted with the subjects of all the Latin books used in the school. The natural bend of my mind was to science. In 1756, Thomas left home to join the crew of a privateer, the King of Prussia. Earlier, he attempted to join the crew of another ship, the Terrible, which was sunk with the loss of most of its crew. His father stopped him at the last minute. Two months later, he did get to sea on the King of Prussia, serving until August 1757. In 1757, he arrived in London. With money earned from his share of King of Prussia's booty, Payne pursued his interest in natural science, attending the Royal Society lectures and befriending other amateur scientists. As his funds depleted, he moved to the town of Sandwich and opened his own stay-making shop. Two years later, in 1759, he married Mary Lambert who died the following year during premature birth of their child. Thomas then entered this school to study mathematics and prove his knowledge of the English language. Later, he studied for a position in the excise service, a collector of internal customs duties. In 1764, he was appointed an excise collector in the town of Alfred, Lincolnshire. Sometime later, he was accused of not inspecting goods before assigning the amount of tax due and dismissed. He eventually moved to London in 1766, where he took a position as an English instructor at a small academy. However, he left after a short while as teaching did not agree with him. He is said to have then tried preaching, also without satisfaction or success. In 1768, he returned to the work as an excise collector, this time in the town of Lewes. Here, he joined an informal debating society. He wrote a poem on the death of General James Wolfe, killed in Quebec during the Seven Years' War. The underlying theme of the poem was really a criticism of British foreign policy. In 1769, Payne's landlord, owner of a tobacco shop, died. Payne stepped in to help the family run the shop. Then, for reasons of propriety, he married his dead benefactor's eldest daughter, Elizabeth, a marriage he later said was never consummated. His employment as an excise officer was difficult and paid little. In an effort to get the attention of the members of Parliament, in 1772, Payne was asked by his fellow officers to put their case in writing. He wrote his first political pamphlet, The Case of the Officers of Excise. The pamphlet talks about general want among the English people caused by increasing prices and the desperation that poverty imposes on people. Poverty and defiance of principle begets a degree of meanness that will stoop to almost anything. 
He who has never hungered may argue finally on the subjection of his appetite, and he who never was distressed may harangue as beautifully on the power of principle. But poverty, like grief, has an incurable deafness which never hears. The oration loses all its edge, and to be, or not to be, becomes the only question. For his trouble, Payne was eventually dismissed from his position, charged with being absent without permission to distribute pamphlets. Also, the tobacco shop soon failed and was sold at auction. He separated from his wife with 35 pounds as a financial settlement. Payne now wandered, searching for some meaning to his life. In 1772, he befriended the mathematician George L. Scott, who had been tutor to George III, and through Scott he was brought into a circle of intellectuals that included Edward Gibbon, astronomer John Bevis, and, most importantly, Benjamin Franklin. It is his association with Franklin that will change his life forever. Franklin convinced Payne that his talents would find ready employment in North America, so in 1774, Payne departed from England. He traveled as a first-class passenger and with a letter of introduction from Benjamin Franklin. This raises speculation on my part whether Payne was, in fact, enlisted by Franklin to convey messages to leading colonials that Franklin could not, without risk of arrest by British authorities. Payne became quite ill on the ship and was bedridden for almost two months after arriving in New York. In the fall, he finally made his way to Philadelphia, where he immediately called upon Franklin's son-in-law, Richard Bache. As an indication of Franklin's influence and Payne's abilities, he soon secured the position of editor of the Pennsylvania Magazine. As was common for this era, he wrote under several pseudonyms. One of his first essays, written in 1774 and published early in 1775 in the Pennsylvania Journal and the Weekly Advertiser, attacked the institution of slavery. He pointed to the moral conflict of the American position. That some desperate wretches should be willing to steal and enslave men by violence and murder for gain is rather lamentable than strange. but that many civilized, nay, Christianized people should approve and be concerned in the savage practice is surprising, and still persist, though it has been so often proved contrary to the light of nature, to every principle of justice and humanity, and even good policy, by a succession of eminent men and several late publications. The colonials were themselves beginning to feel like the Africans they were enslaving. In 1775, Parliament passed an act banning trade between the New England colonies and any other country besides Great Britain. British forces in Boston, anticipating violence, sought to deny the militia ammunition stored at Concord. The result was the skirmish between the so-called Minutemen and British troops at Lexington. Colonial leaders called for a Second Continental Congress to convene in Philadelphia on the 10th of May. John Hancock was elected President of the Congress. Benjamin Franklin, just returned from England, where he was seriously threatened with arrest and imprisonment for treason, was immediately selected to participate. In July, the Congress prepared what became known as the Olive Branch Petition, sent to King George III, hoping the King would respond to their grievances against the Ministry and Parliament. Surveying the worsening situation, Payne revealed to a friend in England what he was convinced would be the inevitable result. Surely the Ministry are all mad. They never will be able to conquer America. In July, 
in an essay in the Pennsylvania Magazine, he referred to the conflict as a defensive war rather than as a revolution or rebellion. In the early 20th century, the historian Charles Andrews argued that what the colonials wanted was a return to the period of salutary neglect under which the colonials and their British trading partners had prospered and the experience of de facto self-government had prevailed. George III had no intention of allowing his colonial subjects to challenge his authority. Nominated by John Adams, George Washington was named Commander-in-Chief of a yet-to-be-formed Continental Army. Days later, the Battle of Bunker Hill occurred, in which the militia performed well enough against the British regulars. Washington immediately departed for Massachusetts, taking command in July of some 17,000 poorly trained militia and undisciplined volunteers. From this time onward, the struggle intensified and the colonial forces experienced defeat after defeat. Thomas Jefferson revealed his innermost concerns to John Randolph in a letter written in August of 1775. If indeed Great Britain, disjoined from her colonies, be a match for the most potent nations of Europe, with the colonies thrown into their scale, they may go on securely. But if they are not assured of this, it would be certainly unwise, by trying the event of another campaign, to risk our accepting a foreign aid which, perhaps, may not be obtainable, but on condition of everlasting avulsion from Great Britain. This would be thought a hard condition to those who still wish for reunion with their parent country. I am sincerely one of those, and would rather be in dependence on Great Britain, properly limited, than on any nation on earth, or than on no nation. But I am one of those, too, who rather than submit to the rights of legislating for us, assumed by the British Parliament, and which late experience has shown they will so cruelly exercise, would lend my hand to sink the whole island in the ocean. The King's response was to declare the colonials in rebellion and send thousands of Britain's best troops to suppress the rebellion and capture the leaders. Any opportunity for negotiation and compromise passed. The colonials chose sides, and a war of attrition was the result. With the conflict on the battlefield going poorly, Benjamin Rush approached Payne to work on a pamphlet that would explain to the colonials what was at stake in the conflict. The result, late in 1775, was common sense published anonymously, of course, because it was a treasonous document in British eyes. Payne wrote that the purpose of the pamphlet was to rescue man from tyranny and false principles of government and enable him to be free. He attacked hereditary rule and monarchy and called for a representative system of government, a republic, with the unicameral legislature, frequent elections, and a written constitution. Much later, in 1786, Payne expressed concern that a unicameral legislature would become, quote, a complete aristocracy, unquote. An estimated 120,000 copies of Common Sense were sold in just a few months, some 500,000 in the first year. Eventually, the pamphlet was produced in 25 editions that first year. Payne donated his royalties from Common Sense to help fund the Continental Army, later recalling, As my wish was to serve an oppressed people and assist in a just and good cause, I conceived that the honor of it would be promoted by my declining to make even the usual profits of an author. Common sense quickly made its way across the Atlantic, 
where English radicals made sure their countrymen got to read Paine's courageous pamphlet. British authorities responded by confiscation of the pamphlet and prosecution of any publisher who dared reprint it. What adds to the power of Paine's arguments for independence was something very new and different. He declared that monarchy and aristocracy must be brought to an end. Of kings, he writes, There is another and greater distinction for which no truly natural or religious reason can be assigned, and that is the distinction of men into kings and subjects. Male and female are the distinctions of nature, good and bad the distinctions of heaven, but how a race of men came into the world so exalted above the rest and distinguished like some new species is worth inquiring into and whether they are the means of happiness or misery to the world. As the year 1776 progressed, the urgency of the situation evolved. The British pulled their troops from Boston and established Canada as their base of operations. The Americans tried but failed to capture Quebec. In May, the Continental Congress held the Virginia Convention, where Richard Henry Lee introduced a resolution for the colonies to become free and independent states. The Congress appointed a committee to draft the formal Declaration of Independence. The committee included Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Robert Livingston, and Roger Sherman. This committee then chose Thomas Jefferson to write the first draft. The final declaration was signed on the 4th of July, 1776. Payne's role now became that of a war correspondent while serving as aide-de-camp to General Nathaniel Green. In December, Payne issued his first crisis paper in which he delivered his famous challenge. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. Tis dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. His second crisis paper in 1777 was addressed to Lord Howe, responding to proposals to settle the war. Payne declared, the meanest peasant in America, blessed with liberty and safety, is a happy man compared with a New York Tory. In April, Payne was appointed secretary to the Committee for Foreign Affairs. He now decided he would record the history of the struggle for independence. And in the third crisis paper, he reviewed the progress to date appealing to all classes to support the war, taking a very harsh position against those who remain loyal to British authority, he called for the persecution of American Tories. Payne's urgings took on an added importance as the year 1777 brought yet another defeat of Washington's forces at the Battle of Brandywine after which British forces occupied Philadelphia and the Congress was forced to flee. In his fourth crisis paper, Payne told his countrymen, The nearer any disease approaches to a crisis, the nearer it is to a cure. In the winter, Payne briefly joined the army at Valley Forge and traveled to York to perform his duties as secretary to the Committee for Foreign Affairs. By June, 
General Howe was ordered to New York, and the Continental Congress returned to Philadelphia. The loyalty of many Philadelphia merchants and speculators to the Patriot cause did not prevent them from seeking personal profits by hoarding goods to sell to the British, who were paying with specie rather than devalued paper currency, huge amounts of which were actually printed and distributed by the British themselves to destroy its purchasing power. Payne's 1778 crisis paper was addressed to the people of England, challenging the English claim to having created the highest order political system. He observed that Britain's political system, instead of civilizing, has tended to brutalize mankind. He also disclosed his own sense of now becoming a world citizen. He wrote, My attachment is to all the world, and not any particular part. Also in 1778, Paine wrote a series of essays promoting a new constitution for Pennsylvania. Some years later, he reflected on the form of government that evolved. At the commencement of the revolution, it was supposed that what is called the executive part of a government was the only dangerous part. But we now see that quite as much mischief, if not more, may be done, and as much arbitrary conduct acted by a legislature. In the same year, Payne inserted himself in the middle of the Silas Dean affair. Dean had been recalled from France to explain huge debts incurred in the name of the Congress. Payne, having access to government documents, let Dean's opponents know that goods Dean claimed were purchased were actually gifts provided by the French government. For disclosing this secret information, Payne was forced to resign from his position as secretary to the committee. He was then hired by Owen Biddle to work as a clerk in Biddle's Philadelphia business. During 1779, the British military strategy shifted the conflict to the southern colonies, where the Loyalist population was largest. Payne's next crisis paper discussed Britain's legacy of debts and declared that America is beyond the reach of conquest. The war in the South seemed to be going well from the standpoint of the British. In 1780, Charleston fell to the British, and Payne urged Americans not to lose heart, that these setbacks would not affect the ultimate outcome. Still desperate for finances, a group of patriots formed the Bank of Pennsylvania. The capital of the bank was to be used for loans made to the government for the war effort. Payne was one of the first to subscribe as a shareholder. Years earlier, Payne wrote that a national debt bound the people together and was important for the war effort. What history reveals, however, is that few governments have paid for wars by taxing those who possess the most wealth and therefore have the most to lose should a war be lost. In 1780, Payne turned his attention to the future. With independence and control over a vast territory eventually secured, he provided his thoughts on how the frontier lands ought to be treated in the pamphlet Public Good. He argued that all western lands, what was then the Northwest Territory, belonged to all the states collectively. Sale of these lands would, he stated, be an important source of income for the Congress. Unfortunately, he did not consider the future and the price future generations would have to pay just to acquire even a small piece of land. In recognition of some of the unresolved difficulties of governing the new nation, Payne also called for a convention to consider amendments to the Articles of Confederation. As late as 1781, the certainty of victory of the colonials over the British army remained in question. The Continental Army was short on supplies and weapons. Payne volunteered to accompany John Lorenz to France 
to assist Benjamin Franklin in an effort to secure French naval support and additional financial aid. Payne's role seems to have been the writing of reports on their progress back to the Congress. Payne actually decided not to return to America with Lorenz, but eventually relented. They departed France on the 1st of June and arrived in Boston on 25th of August, where they arranged for transport of the war materials to Philadelphia. An army of some 5,500 Frenchmen under the Comte de Rochambeau landed in Rhode Island early in 1781. Rochambeau convinced George Washington that the best strategy would be to move their army south, while the French fleet under the command of the Comte de Grasse did the same. Their objective was the army under Lord Cornwallis at Yorktown in Virginia. In the beginning of September, de Grasse defeated a British fleet on its way to relieve Cornwallis, who was besieged by a force under the command of Lafayette. By late September, the American and French forces had Cornwallis surrounded and the British were forced to surrender. By late October, George Washington was back in Philadelphia. The army encamped for the winter. From Payne, Washington received a letter in which Payne said he felt mistreated by the nation with which he had dealt generously and honorably. He informed Washington he was contemplating a return to Europe, where he said, I have literary fame, and I am sure I cannot experience worse fortune. Payne's expression of frustration raises the question of why he felt he had been mistreated by those with whom he had fought and served in the cause of independence. Was it a matter of financial reward or simply formal recognition of what his writing had meant to the nation? As stated earlier, one of Payne's planned projects was to write a history of the American Revolution. In France, the Abbe Renal produced his own version of the conflict in 1781, titled The Revolution in America. Payne responded before the year's end with a critical review. Renal concluded the American Revolution resembled all revolutions in history, to which Payne countered, it is in vain to look for precedents among the revolutions of former ages to find out, by comparison, the causes of this. Here, the value and quality of liberty, the nature of government, and the dignity of man were known and understood, and the attachment of the Americans to these principles produced the revolution as a natural, unavoidable consequence. Payne also referred to himself as a citizen of the world. He declared, The true idea of a great nation is that which extends and promotes the principles of universal society, whose mind rises above the atmosphere of local thoughts and considers mankind, of whatever nation or profession they may be, the work of the Creator. For Payne, the principles for creation of the just society are universal. He also believed they came to us from a conscious creator, yet destructively we demonstrate our free will by consistently rejecting those principles in the promotion of narrow self-interest. The reinforcement of this tendency, Payne would later ascribe not merely to monarchy, aristocracy, and their claims to privilege, but to organized religion. Payne's contributions to the war effort were, in fact, well appreciated. In response to his declared financial plight, he was brought into the new federal government as what historians later described as a paid propagandist, reporting to Robert Morris. Payne denied he ever wrote anything during this period in which he did not fully accept as his own beliefs. In one document, he commented on the unique nature and obligations of citizenship, 
in the new nation and on what lies ahead. Every man in America stands in a twofold order of citizen. He is a citizen of the state he lives in and of the United States. And without justly and truly supporting his citizenship in the latter, he will inevitably sacrifice the former. Of interest is Payne's use of the initial capitals when writing United States. Were the states still sovereign and voluntarily joined together in confederation? Or was state sovereignty relinquished in the creation of one nation, the United States? Somewhat hopefully, perhaps naively, he observed, The times that tried men's souls are over, and the greatest and completest revolution the world ever knew gloriously and happily accomplished. He would have more to say on the subject as the newly independent but united states struggled under the Articles of Confederation and eventually sent representatives to Philadelphia where they drafted a new constitution. <laughs>